Amen. Well, if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 9, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 17 this morning. Genesis 9, verses 8 through 17. Last time we saw how God, in resending man into the earth, gave him additional rights, additional protections, which man did not need in the pre fallen world. But he does need them now in a post flood world. And we saw that God gives to all these mercies, these privileges, these protections, these additional rights. They benefit man as man. They are not the fruits and graces of salvation. They come under what we call common grace. So, for example, God didn't cause the animals to fear only believers. The animals fear all people. Right? God didn't tell that only believers could eat the animals for meat. You can't have meat until you become a Christian. The animals were given to all human beings for food, which had not been done until this time. And God doesn't protect only believers with commanded capital punishment for their murderers. The murderers of all are commanded to be put to death by God. And so God gives all of these additional protections and rights to all human beings, to man as Man, And that's because, as we saw in our text last week, all human beings still bear, still are made in the image and likeness of God. Though corrupted by sin, though depraved in every part, though uh, under God's wrath and, and would be damned if it were not for God's grace, all human beings in the same condition, all needing salvation, yet still God does not allow his image in anyone to be extinguished. Corrupted, even ruined, but still there. Still in God's image and so still having these protections and these rights by God as he sends out again man into the world. But because we are made in God's image, we all have the same responsibility before God, the same accountability. Whether or not a person believes in God, They are still responsible before him to live according to the exact same standard. Which is the image and likeness of God. And no one gets a pass. No one can say, well, I'm a victim of my circumstances. You you don't understand who my parents were. I don't have to keep the standard. Oh, yes, you do. Precisely because you are equal. You are still fully human. No matter what your circumstances are, yes... Sin does bring into the world certain situations where maybe a person has less ability or less opportunity. Jesus spoke in in that way of a stricter judgment or a more tolerable judgment. And he says to whom much is given, much is required. And therefore the converse is also true. But every human being will be judged according to the image of God that they are made in. And what that means, the full moral list of perfect righteousness of the commandments and that we are all given equal rights and equal responsibility yes according to our situations but we are responsible moral agents and that's why human life is to be held in high esteem that's where human dignity comes from and it's equal to all And this alone is why there can be something like liberty and justice for all. That there can be just and free human societies. What we saw last week was the foundation for all of those things. And you know what's interesting? Our text this morning doesn't add a thing to any of it. What our text does this morning is something very important. It takes all of those things that God has now said that he will do that he will hold man to, that he will give to man. He takes that existing relationship that God has with the whole earth, as we'll see in our text, and he codifies and he formalizes it in that convention that the Bible knows as covenant. We're going to look at what a covenant is and why that's important to us this morning. Let's pray as we turn to God's word. Father, we thank you again for your word and we pray you would bless it that you would cause it to bear fruit in our hearts, that we would grow in the truth, that we would be able to discern and reject error and false teaching in this particular area, area especially, Lord. Help what I say, Lord God, to be helpful to your people. Let it be true. Let us believe only the truth and reject every false way. And we pray this 
in Jesus' name. Hear now the word of the Lord from Genesis chapter 9, beginning in verse 8. This is the word of Almighty God. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never. Again, shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my bow in the cloud and it shall be For the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth. That the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood. To destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The word of the Lord. I want you to notice, first of all, this morning, the covenant conceived. I want you to notice the covenant conceived. You know, we hear a lot about first responders in our day. Typically, we talk about policemen, firemen, or EMTs and and ambulance personnel who are the first to arrive on a scene, right, of some catastrophe, some tragedy, some, some event, and they respond. Well, all of life is to be lived in response to God. You know, we have a call of worship, a call to worship every week. And I like to remind folks in the new members class, that's, that's important, that's on purpose. That goes way back in the ancient church, even into the synagogues, that re- worship can only come as a response. Worship can never be initiated. We can never just decide, hey, let's go and worship God. We think that's a good idea. We're supposed to worship God, but as servants who come in response to God's invitation to come, right? That's why we come on the Lord's Day. He's already commanded us to worship on the Lord's Day. And we come with a word from God first, leading the way, and then we respond, right? Well, that's what covenant is, beloved. Covenant is God's idea. Covenant is something that God initiates, that God makes with man. Man would never have the right to go into God's presence and say, I have an idea. Let's have this arrangement where I'm going to do this and you're going to do that. And and here's my responsibility and here's yours. Man can't do that to God. Man has to respond to God. God has given to man everything that he is. His life, his will, his heart, his mind, his understanding, his body. His ability to live in this world. God gives and sustains it all. So we respond, right? God speaks. God commands. God promises. God threatens. And what do we do? We respond. And the right response is faith. Is obedience. And we come before the one who is perfect. And we respond and we give him glory. And he has given to us so much, right? We are made in his image. It was God who initiated all the things that we've seen in Genesis so far. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to to preach through Genesis. Because it seems to me that today, more than ever in my lifetime, more than ever than I've ever seen studying history, the very foundations of human society are under attack like never before. They're being assaulted. The foundations, the pillars, not just of human society, but of the very human nature that we are. You know, things like, what is a woman? What is a man? Stuff that no one would ever think that human beings would fight about. That's under attack today. 
It's crazy. It really is. And it used to be that these things were called mental illness when you would question things. When you would say, yes, I see what reality is, but I don't believe reality. That's what, a, what's, what, that's what an insane person does, right? He thinks there's spiders crawling on him, but they're not. Well, that's what we used to call thinking you're a man, but you're not. It's insanity. It's a denial of truth. That's, that's the reality that we live in. And so by going to Genesis, we've seen and we've been able to, to uh, affirm and to firm up those foundations and those pillars from the very word of God. And we've even looked at how that word shows itself to be true in nature. And I've tried to bring to you many scientific facts that we can see and know. Facts, not theories. That we can see and know. How God has created all things. How man has a human nature that's distinct. How man is now fallen and sinful and we are inclined to evil. We've seen the reality of God's judgment in the world and yet also the message of salvation. We've seen institutions like marriage. We've seen male and female that God created us in. We've looked at family, public worship. We've looked at the responsibility to work six days, to rest one. We've seen all of these things in the book of Genesis. And now we've seen where God has given the animals for us to eat. And we know that that's part of our purpose. We can eat animals if we want to. If we don't want to, we don't have to. But we understand why the animals are here. And we don't deify them and worship them. And we understand things like capital punishment for murderers because man is made in the very image of God. And that's why... Murderers, mur- those who willfully kill people who they should not kill, innocent people, must be put to death precisely because man is that high of a creature, right? That is how we value human life. We've seen all of that in our text. Well, in our text this morning, we get introduced to, in fact, God actually makes a covenant. If you notice it in the text, God begins saying, I, I will establish, I establish. By the last verse of our text, I have established. It's done. The covenant is erected between God and man in our text. And it's by God's initiative. Notice it in verse 9. I establish my covenant. Verse 11. I establish my covenant. And verse 17. The covenant which I have established. The words established in Hebrew is kum. It means to stand. In other words, God has made his covenant to stand. God has done it. You know, you take like that, I don't know, a candle or something that's laying down and you make it stand. God has taken this word, this contract, which is what a covenant is, and he has made it to stand with man. We've already seen that there is a covenant before this, right? The covenant of works in the garden. After God made man, and this is crucial, after he made him, he put him in the garden and then he gives him the command to eat from the trees but not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's called the covenant of works. That is affirmed by Reformed theology in the Westminster Standards, chapter 7, paragraph 2. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. It was a covenant of works because man would have life by his works. We are in a covenant of grace, which was announced in the garden after man fell, that God would cause the seed of the woman to crush the head of the serpent. And Adam and Eve lived by faith in that promise. That's the gospel, that God would send a savior for man. That's the seed promise, as it were. And God adds to it after that and expands man's knowledge of what that means and what that will look like. But it was given right in the garden. So we have the covenant of works. We have the covenant of works broken. We have the covenant of grace pronounced. And now in our text comes what's called the covenant of preservation or the Noahic covenant, which falls under the covenant of grace, right? Because if there was no covenant of grace, the flood would have been full and final. There wouldn't have been a sparing of sinful man. So the covenant of preservation comes under the covenant of grace. It tells us what God is going to do with regard to the world. But it doesn't give us any new information, does it? It simply says, in particular, we'll notice, it makes one particular promise. But I bring all this up to point out that covenants, again, are conceived by God. 
and they're administered to God. There are covenants between men because men need to make arrangements too, as we'll notice. But here we're noticing the divine covenant between God and man. And every one, covenant of works, covenant of grace, and all the sub-covenants under the covenant of grace are entirely by divine initiative. Secondly, I want you to notice the covenant revealed. I want you to to notice the covenant revealed. Covenant is very important in Reformed theology. We talk about covenant theology as a subset of Reformed theology and biblical theology as a subset and systematic theology. And these are different ways of doing theology as it were. But in our chapter this morning, Genesis chapter 9, the word covenant appears seven times. Bereith in Hebrew, diatheke in Greek. Seven times. Only two chapters in the whole Bible have it more. So covenant is very important in Genesis chapter 9. And the first thing I want to say about covenant is that covenant is not a relationship. Did you hear that? Covenant, a covenant is not a relationship. That is one of the most serious errors that you can make with regard to understanding what a covenant is. And I say that because that is the very position that the federal vision movement has taken. And that is what they teach. And that is what they have taught since Norman Shepard put that forward in the 70s under what was called shepherdism, which was also rejected as heretical. Why is this important? Because if you misunderstand covenant and you think that the covenant is a relationship rather than that covenant entails and speaks to an already existing relationship, you're going to make or at least have the potential to make all sorts of very, very serious errors. But let me just give you some of the teachers in the Federal Vision Movement, which is still very much alive and well, and unfortunately infecting the Reformed Church, the conservative church, like never before. Steve Schlissel says this, quote, Covenant is relationship. That is what a covenant is, relationship, end quote. John Barak, quote, covenant isn't a thing that you can analyze. Covenant is a relationship, end quote. Steve Wilkins, covenant as it relates to man simply is the relationship of love and communion with the triune living God, end quote. James Jordan, the covenant joins the three persons of God in a community of life in which man was created to participate End quote. That's got some serious problems that we don't have time to go into. And then Doug Wilson in his Credenda Agenda magazine, quote, Covenant is a relationship between persons. A covenant does not consist in a list of names, but is a relation between persons. These names are not the covenant any more than the two names on an invitation constitute a marriage. They may accurately describe the parties to the marriage, but they are not the marriage itself. That's a straw man argument by Doug Wilson. That's a strong man argument. Nobody, no reformed theologian in the world has ever said that the marriage invitation on which the names appear is the covenant. The covenant is the contract that two people enter into when they get married. That has all kinds of new rights and privileges and responsibilities that they did not have the day before. No man is called to love his wife as Christ loved the church until he enters the contract and agrees to it of marriage. And that contract is not the relationship. He and that woman have already had a relationship for a while usually. In fact, they're usually engaged for some time. The covenant codifies, formalizes, binds in a relationship The covenant is the contract, not the relationship. Marriage is a contract. Again, where you take a vow in sickness and in health, for in plenty and in want, for richer and for poorer, that's something you're entering into. And you take that vow and you enter into that contract. And now the husband and the wife have all sorts of rights and privileges and responsibilities they never had. Until the marriage contract. But to say that the covenant is the relationship is absolute falsehood and must be rejected. Covenants presume 
covenants predicate upon, covenants entail, covenants codify and formalize a relationship, but a covenant is not the relationship. That leads to the federal vision errors of sacramentalism, of externalism, of a denial and distortion of many doctrines like imputation, like justification, election, the church, family, the church as invisible and invisible, and even the imputed righteousness of Christ, which they, many of them, deny or distort. Beloved, a covenant is a contract, and that's what we have in this text. God is not now initiating a relationship between himself and Noah. He's already had that relationship. It was because of his relationship with Noah that he told him to build the ark. It was because of his relationship with the animals and the earth that he told them to get on the ark. The covenant isn't the relationship. The covenant is God's sovereign declaration of what he will do and how he will treat those creatures from now on. It is a new uh, program, as it were, of things. But there is already a relationship. And the covenant comes in for assurance, for the assurance ultimately of man. To whom is the covenant made in this text? Notice it in verse 9 and 10, with you and your descendants after you. And then in verse 10, with every living creature that is with you. God's making a covenant with birds, with beasts, with creeping things. And I love the end of verse, where is it? 13. The covenant between me and the earth. Now, that's a metonymy. God, when God says the earth, he means the things of the earth. But he's saying everything. This covenant is between me and everything. The covenant is not the relationship. The covenant is declaring the stipulations of the relationship God already has with his creatures and especially with man. You see how serious an error that is of the federal vision. But all the way through verse 15, verse 16, verse 17, we see that they over and over again, all the creatures of the earth, every creature on the earth, the earth itself, me and the earth, all flesh that is on the earth, between me and all flesh, this is the covenant that's revealed. And apart from God's revealing of himself and of our duty, we would never know how to relate to him. That too is declared in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Chapter 7, section 1. Although the distance between God and the creature is so great that reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet, here it is, they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward except by some voluntary condescension on God's part which he hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. In other words, we could never know. How we are to live for him. How do we are to serve him. What our responsibilities are. If, unless God would have spoken by covenant. The covenant is the contract. The covenant is the agreement. The covenant is the declaration. The covenant is the proclamation. The covenant is the stipulation. The pledge. The promise. The bargain. The bond. The treaty. The constitution. The charter. The deal. The accord. The compact. The settlement, the commitment. We see covenants between Abraham and Abimelech, Isaac and Gerar, Jacob and Laban, mostly between equals, where they've already had a relationship, but they're declaring the rules regarding certain things. It's a contract, beloved. And why do we have contracts? Why do we enter into contracts? When you have someone come and work in your house and you have a contract and they agree to do this and you agree to pay them this and here's the time frame, why do we do that? To make sure everybody gets what they're supposed to get, right? It's for assurance. It it binds us so that we can keep our word. Man from immemorial times has had contracts, covenants, whatever you want to call them, bonding agreements by which we can know that we can get from one another what we're supposed to get. Covenants come in for assurance. That we would have assurance of faith, as it were. Okay, I believe you're going to dig this well for me. And I believe you're going to pay me this much. And we have witnesses that will sign this covenant and the lawyers will make darn sure that we do our parts, right? But you have all that, right? You're buying a house, whatever. You have this formal agreement for assurance sake, beloved. And that's what this covenant does. It gives man assurance. What is the content of this covenant called the Noahic covenant? One promise from God. You see it repeated three times in verses 11 and 15. This is the Noahic covenant. 
Verse 11, thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. First time it's described. Second time, never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And then verse 15, and I remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. That's the Noahic covenant. Never again. By the way, this proves that the flood of Noah was universal. Because many times floods have come and wiped out local regions. And God couldn't be saying, I'm never going to have another local flood like I did with Noah. It's got to be that all flesh was killed. And God said he'll never do that again. And he never has done that again. There will be a judgment by fire one day. And all flesh will be judged. And there have been many local judgments by water and by fire. We're going to see Sodom and Gomorrah at some point in Genesis if we continue. And if we would go into Exodus, the great judgments of God upon Egypt. And yet, not all flesh and not by water did all the world get covered. And so this promise from God, this revealed word, is to give man assurance that he can live in the world and do what he said. And so I want you to notice the covenant signified. I want you to notice the covenant signified. There is no power in covenants to do anything. A covenant is a contract. It doesn't have any power. It's God saying certain things about what he's going to do or what we're supposed to do. But the covenant itself is not magic. You're not saved by covenant. This is, sometimes you hear this kind of language. Oh, I'm trusting in the covenant. You better not be trusting in the covenant. You better be trusting in the God of the covenant. You better be trusting in Christ. The covenant is the communication of the promise. But we trust that Jesus kept his word. That he did these things. The covenant itself is simply the words of God's decision as to how he is going to treat or respond to man in some situation. But the covenant is entirely from God and by grace. And God gave the covenant for our assurance and he gives the sign for our assurance. I mean, what does a sign do? Think about it. A sign points to something else, right? A sign is never in and of itself what you're supposed to look at. Like if I was going to Salzburg and I see the sign that says Salzburg 15, I don't stop and say, oh, wow, Salzburg 15 sign. We're in Salzburg now. The sign tells me I'm on the right road. It assures me that Salzburg is coming, but I still have to obey the sign, believe in it, and get there. The sign doesn't do anything for me unless I believe and look to what it's pointing to. And that's what... The sign of the covenant does. Let me ask you this. We, we know what the sign of the covenant is, right? We're gonna, I'm saving that for the last point, the rainbow. Does the rainbow stop the flood? Does a rainbow physically stop a flood of water from coming? Does the rainbow in any sense effect, give power to God's promise that a flood won't come anymore? Why, it's going to hit those colored lights and the water's going to stop. No. It has nothing to do with effectually bringing about God's promise at all. It points to the reality that God will keep his word. God said he'll do something. He gives something to show us we can trust him to keep his word. That's why Hebrews chapter 6, when speaking of God, entering into covenants with man, says this in verse 17, thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, which is what the communication of the covenant is, confirmed it by an oath. The oath The swearing, the giving of a sign, thus by two immutable things, which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. We might have refuge. We might be encouraged to believe. How do I know Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? Because he rose again from the dead. That encourages me to believe he was able to do these things. He did miracles. He did signs that proved he was more than man. And so the sign is given to confirm faith. That's why the rainbow is given. John Calvin says this on this verse, quote, a sign is added to the promise in which is exhibited, in which the, the, sign, the sign exhibits, in which is exhibited the wonderful kindness of God, who, here it is, who for the purpose of confirming our faith in his word. 
It's the only reason for the sign. For the purpose of confirming our faith in his word does not disdain to use such helps as a sign. He doesn't disdain to use things like rainbows, things like water, things like bread and wine to confirm his promise. Some theologians claim we shouldn't have signs. God doesn't need to use signs. His word should just attest to itself. It just should authenticate itself. But Acts 2.22 says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you, not by himself, by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. How do I know Jesus was the Messiah? Because he did signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Jesus himself says that. If you don't believe in me, believe in me for the work's sake. Believe in the signs. Who else could do them? Nicodemus understood that. No one can come from God unless, or no one can can be a, a teacher of God and do the things you do unless he comes from God. The signs, the miracles, they proved him to be what he was. Calvin again says this about this fact. Quote, it appears to some absurd that faith should be sustained by such helps. But they who speak thus do not in the first place reflect on the great ignorance and imbecility of our minds. He always pulls his punches, doesn't he? Nor do they secondly ascribe to the working of the secret power of the spirit that praise which is due. It is the work of God alone to begin and to perfect faith. The work of God alone. And God uses those signs because we are weak and as Calvin says, imbecilic. So I need to see something, right? I need to touch something. It helps us. Should I just believe because God speaks? Yeah, I should. Wasn't enough for Gideon though. Puts out a fleece, puts out another fleece. Wasn't enough for Moses. Here's the sign. You'll worship on this mountain. Wasn't enough for the people of Israel. Well, throw your stick down. It'll become a snake. That'll show them I sent you. Put your hand in your bosom. Leprous. Healed. That'll that'll prove to them. They should just believe in you because I sent you. I'm going to give you signs because they need help. We need help. God gives us signs. And that rainbow sign assures us that God will never again destroy the world with a flood. But again, that sign doesn't do it. We never want to idolatrize the signs, right? That can happen in baptism. It has happened in baptism where people think that that water actually washes away sin or actually regenerates. It does not. There is not a single drop of justifying faith, I'm sorry, justifying grace or, justify, or justifying grace or converting grace in baptism. Baptism is all, in fact, the sacraments are all about sanctifying grace. The sacraments are not, hear me, converting ordinances. You don't become a Christian because you were baptized or because you've had the Lord's Supper. You become a Christian by believing. And you believe because you were born again. And baptism doesn't cause The new birth. It is a sign of the new birth. It is a seal of these things. It, to use the language of our BCO, it represents, it signifies, it seals, but it never does. That is sacramentalism. Oh, I've been baptized. I'm going to heaven. I've had the Lord's Supper today. My sins are forgiven. You trust in Jesus and you go to heaven. And the baptism points you back to Jesus. It's the only one who can wash you. And the Lord's Supper points you back to Jesus. Remember that he shed his blood. And you use those signs to believe more in Jesus. But again, according to our confession and catechism, the sacraments do not effect the works that they signify and seal. That's medieval Catholicism. That's ex opera operata. By the working of the works. They're signs, very important signs. They're seals from God himself. But they point to Jesus. And they do no good unless you believe in Jesus. That's true for the Lord's Supper. And that's true for baptism. Let me tell you from our confession. Chapter 91. How do the sacraments become effectual means of salvation? Here's what we're talking about. How do the sacraments become effectual means of salvation? Question 91 of the Shorter Catechism. Answer. The sacraments become effectual means of salvation. Not 
from any virtue in them. Not from any virtue in them or in him that doth administer them, but only by the blessing of Christ and the working of his spirit in them that by faith receive them. You get nothing from the sacraments unless you believe. That's true for baptism too. Why do we baptize infants then? Because the parents believe. We would never baptize a child unless the parents professed faith. And it's for their faith until such time as the child believes. And then it points them to Jesus too. But we believe their children have a right to the sign because their parents believe. And all that their parents own are Jesus's. And so are their children. So they get the sign too. Even as the children of Abraham got the sign when they couldn't believe yet. They were too young. They get the sign. So that's what we do. But it is a sign. Westminster Shorter Catechism number 92. What is a sacrament? Quote, answer. A sacrament is an holy ordinance instituted by Christ, wherein by sensible signs, listen, Christ and the benefits of the new covenant are represented, are sealed, and applied to believers. To believers. The unbeliever gets nothing. To believers. Sacraments strengthen faith. That's what they do. They say, yes, what Jesus said about washing you from your sins, yes, that's true. Look, even this water is on you now washing you. Do you believe that? If you're baptized and you don't believe in Jesus and you never believe in Jesus, it would have been better for you to not be baptized. That's a responsibility as well as a promise. It's something that God says. And when we break, the, when we don't believe, we break the covenant. And we show forward that the sign is a lie. And so sacraments are good, but they're not converting ordinances. That was a very serious error that was made at times even among the Puritans. The halfway covenant. They don't convert people. The gospel converts. The sacraments are signs and seals of the gospel. Yes, you can believe it. Here's why. Look at this. But you believe in Jesus. And you're saved. And I want to point back again now get back to the rainbow God's promise signified by the rainbow right and everyone's going to benefit there's a sense in which again this covenant is given to the animals they're not going to be saved by the blood of Christ the physical world is going to continue but those who believe that sign benefit in another way and so fourthly and lastly I want you to notice the covenant established The covenant established. This is not a covenant between God and his church. It's clear. It's to all mankind. It's to all the beasts. It's to all flesh. The birds, the beasts, everything. It's it's a covenant between God and the earth. It's unique in that sense. It falls under the covenant of grace. It doesn't further it. It doesn't give us more details about the Savior. It says this arena of salvation, it will be secure. This is where it's going to happen. I won't start over again. Go, be fruitful, multiply, build your societies. You'll still be liable to me. I've already talked to you about putting to death the murderer. And yet you're to eat meat but not to eat the blood and, and all of that stuff. Marriage between one man and one. All that stuff, I'm still going to be over you. But I will not destroy the whole world again. Until judgment day when I will give all to account. But this is the... The covenant is established by the end of our text. You see it. This is the sign of the covenant, verse 17, which I have established between me and all the flesh and all the, all, that is on the earth. And again, that sign is the rainbow. Now, in the providence of God, it's the month of June. And I don't know when it started, but at some point in recent history, the month of June became what's known as Pride Month. And you all know what that means. That... People are encouraged to celebrate or declare something good, something to be proud of, that God says is inherently shameful, something that is an abomination. And in fact, they have taken the rainbow, and we all know this, right? And they've used that image to declare this movement. The very thing, the flood, the judgment that God gave because of sins like that, They take that sign that God says, I'm never going to do another one. And they celebrate that very sin with that sign. I want you to think about that. And yet in spite of that, 
unbelievable effrontery to, to Almighty God to take the very sign of, I'm not going to destroy the world again for sins like this, and to say, we love this sin with that sign. And yet still God stays his hand. And he does not bring judgment. It will come. But what I want you to notice is the, is the picture of that bow. Look at verse again, 12 and 13. This is the sign of the covenant which I make between you and every living creature. Again, beyond a, a salvific covenant. It includes the world in some sense. But verse 13, I set my rainbow in the cloud. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. By the way, the word rainbow in Hebrew, there's no word for rainbow. It's the word bow. Kesheth. Hunting bow. War bow. Bow and arrow. It's bow. There's no rainbow. Bow. And God is literally saying, I hang my bow in the clouds. Over and over again, more than ten times in Scripture, God is declared as a warrior with a bow and arrow who actually shoots his arrows at mankind. To give you one place, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. God has bent his bow. He has set me up as a target for his arrow. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. That's Jeremiah talking about how the judgment of Jerusalem has affected him. He feels like God has shot him with arrows. Over and over again, God is the great archer in the sky. Jonathan Edwards famously talked about in his sinners in the hands of an angry God that God's arrow right now is aimed at your heart. And the only thing that holds it back is his mere mercy. There is nothing in you. In fact, everything in you is crying out for him to shoot. As a sinner, he should shoot. But he holds his hand. He stays. He keeps his fingers on the string. Because today is the day of salvation. And that bow that God hangs in the cloud, I want you to think of it as a war bow. And it's bent, right? I, you know, I know that this is the way it appears. I know the properties of light. It would be different. But it's, the way it always appears is a bow that's bent like a bow. And it's pointed up. It's not pointed down. I don't know why the rainbow always forms that way, but it's always formed where the bow is pointed up, as if the arrow is aimed at heaven, right? And not at the earth. And we know the fulfillment of the salvation of Christ is that he comes, who is in heaven, the Son of God, and he takes the arrow of God's wrath. For all of the elect who will ever live, for everyone who will ever be saved, Jesus takes the wrath of God. That's the significance of the promise that we who believe have. Yes, everybody benefits from the fact that God is not going to send another flood. They benefit er, physically. But only those who believe this sign, only those who look to that rainbow and remember God's hand is stayed by his mercy, which is paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes. And with a view to that, God can hang up his bow. But that's the only reason that he can hang up his bow is because Jesus will come and take his wrath for his people. And that's why the earth continues. And that's what I want you to remember. Every time you see one of those rainbows proudly displayed this month, that God's wrath is stayed by the hand of Christ. Pray for them. Pray that they will understand what the rainbow really means. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the signs and seals that you condescend to give us with your word. Oh Lord, what a gracious and gentle God you are. That you consider our weakness, yes, our imbecility. And you give us signs. Tangible things, sensible things. Things we can feel, things we can see. Things we can eat. To assure us that your word is good. Oh, Lord God, you whose word is always good. What condescension to give us an extra assurance that you tell the truth. And yet you've done that. You've done that in the rainbow, Lord God. The judgment is coming. But today's the day of salvation. Today you stay your hand. Today's the day to believe in the one who takes all of your wrath for all of your people. And who who can bring salvation to any who believe. We pray for those in our nation, Lord God, who are celebrating this month and are celebrating sinful abominations. We pray that you would have mercy on them, that you would open their eyes, that you would cause them to be ashamed rather than to be proud, to be ashamed of that which is inherently shameful, and that they would see the rainbow as a day of salvation, as ultimately the 
peace that Christ brings, that you have still, as we saw in Revelation, still around your throne, the rainbow. You still remember it. You'll never forget your mercy because Jesus sealed it on his hands in our stead. And we thank you for that. We praise you in Jesus' name.